Hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for listening to my talk on the topic of an essentialist framework for social ontology. So in recent work, uh, Brian Epstein has suggested that social ontology is concerned with how the social world is built. So he writes, quote, we want an account of how the social world is built. What are its building blocks and how do they come together to build it, end quote. So I agree with Epstein uh, that the question of how the social world is built is a central question for social ontology. Um, but I think that in addition to this central question, there's another central concern of social ontology, which is a concern with the essence of the social world. And in this talk, I want to motivate uh, and develop this idea that another central concern of social ontology is a concern with the essence of the social world. So my talk will be in four parts. Um, I'll begin by reviewing Epstein's grounding anchoring framework uh, for social ontology. I'll then move on to consider uh, a debate in social ontology, namely the debate on the nature of money. And I'll argue that uh, this debate can't be construed adequately as a debate either about grounding or anchoring. Then I'll move on to consider a second debate uh, in social ontology, namely, the debate about uh, the nature of social groups, about what a social group is. And again, I'll argue that uh, this debate can't adequately be, uh, adequately be uh, construed as either a debate about grounding or anchoring. And finally, uh, I'll sketch an essentialist framework for social ontology and I'll suggest that both of these debates can be construed as uh, debates about the essence of certain social items. Okay, so let's start then with uh, Epstein's grounding anchoring frame framework. So on Epstein's framework, uh, there are two central projects in social ontology. The first is the grounding project. So the grounding project asks, what are the grounds of social facts? And here the interest might be in particular social facts or in some general class of social facts. And Epstein takes grounds to be uh, the metaphysical reason that a fact obtains. So by giving the grounds of a social fact, we're giving the metaphysical reason that that social fact is the case. Okay, so here are some sample questions uh, and answers then within the grounding project. So a sample question would be, what grounds the fact that a particular piece of paper, say Billy, is or constitutes a US dollar bill? And a possible answer here would be that uh, Billy is a piece of paper issued by the US Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Um, so this might be uh, the Surlian answer to this question. Another sample question is, what grounds social facts generally? And a possible answer would be the individualist answer, which is that it's individualistic facts that ground social facts generally, um, so, in particular, facts about individuals and their interactions. Okay, so that's the grounding project. Uh, the second project, then, for social ontology is the anchoring project. And that project asks, what are the anchors of social facts? Now, Epstein takes uh, anchors to be that which puts in place or sets up certain general principles that he calls frame principles which describe how facts of a certain form are grounded. So for instance, uh, when it comes to facts of the form X is a US dollar bill, uh, the anchors would be those facts that put in place or set up general principles that describe how facts of the form X is a US dollar bill are grounded. Okay, so here then are some sample questions and answers uh, within the anchoring project. So one question would be, what anchors the frame principles, or the, sorry, the frame principle that describes how facts of the form X is a US dollar bill are grounded? And a possible answer, uh, which Epstein attributes to Searle, is that it's collective acceptance of a constitutive rule uh, that, that anchors this frame principle. Another uh, question within the anchoring project would be, what anchors the frame principle that describes how facts of the form X is a war criminal are grounded? And here a possible answer might be that it's certain statutes uh, of the International Criminal Court. 
Okay, uh, so that's Epstein's grounding anchoring framework. Uh, so now I want to move on to the first uh, debate within social ontology that I want to consider, which is the debate about the nature of money. So I think that uh, this debate centers around a simple question or a question that's simple to state, which is the question, what is money? And I think that there are at least four different views uh, that we can find in the literature, which all give different answers uh, to this question. So the first view we might call the functionalist view. So this view says that something is money just in case it fulfills certain functions, namely the functions of being a medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. And this is the conception of money that one will find in standard economics textbooks. Uh, it's also been uh, developed and endorsed uh, by Francesco Guala. Okay, so a different uh, but related view would be a causal powers view uh, that says that something is money just in case it has certain causal powers. And this sort of uh, account has been recently developed by Uskali Maki uh, in an unpublished paper. Third sort of view I'll call the functional deontic view. So this view says that something is money just in case it has certain functions, namely the functions of being a medium of exchange, store of value, and unit of account. And moreover, uh, users of that thing have certain deontic powers. So this, uh, I think, is John Searle's account. And on this account, money is understood both in terms of function and in terms of an associated deontology for users of money. Okay, and finally, uh, there's the deontic view, which says that something is money just in case users of that thing have certain deontic powers. Um, so this keeps the deontic aspect of Searle's account, but drops the functional aspect. And I think a view of this sort has been developed by Frank Hendricks uh, in a recent unpublished paper. Okay, so these then are uh, four different views that give answers to the question of what money is. So now what I want to suggest is that uh, these are not views about anchoring or about grounding. And so we can't adequately represent this debate as a debate either about anchoring or about grounding. So let's start with anchoring. So I think it's pretty clear uh, that these views are not about anchoring. So they're not views about what it is that puts in place or sets up certain principles concerning money. Okay, what about grounding? So I think more plausibly this debate is construed as a debate about what grounds facts of the form X is money. Nevertheless, I think that uh, that wouldn't be an adequate way of representing this debate. And the reason is that, uh, at least generally speaking on Epstein's framework, the grounds of social facts could have been different than they actually are, since uh, the social facts could have been anchored differently. In particular, we could, have been, we could have anchored different frame principles for those social facts. So consider again, facts of the form, X is a US dollar bill. So these facts uh, were anchored in a certain way and there's a certain frame principle, but they could have been anchored differently so that the frame principle was different. And then the grounds of those facts would be different. Similarly, uh, when it comes to facts of the form X is a war criminal, um, we can imagine that the relevant statutes of the International Criminal Court had been different. And then if the statutes are the anchors, um, then the grounds of facts of the form X is a war criminal would have been different than they actually are. Okay, but now let's uh, return to the, the four different views of money. Um, so consider the functionalist view. So on the functionalist view, uh, money could not have been anything other than whatever it is that fulfills the functions of being a medium of exchange, store of value, or unit of account. Sorry, and unit of account. Similarly, on the causal powers view, money could not have been anything other than that which has certain causal powers. And similarly, I think on the other two views. And so for this reason, uh, I think we shouldn't think of these views as aiming to give uh, the grounds of facts of the form X is money, or at least that's not 
the only thing that they're aiming to do. So I'll briefly note that I don't think that this issue can be uh, avoided by moving from Epstein's grounding anchoring framework to uh, a grounding only framework of the sort that Jonathan Schaffer has proposed. Um, and the reason for that is that I think on a grounding only framework, it's still the case that generally speaking, social facts could have had other grounds um, than they actually do. And so the same worry arises. Okay, uh, let me now move on to the second debate that I want to discuss, which is the debate about uh, the nature of social groups. So here the central question is, what is a social group? So what is, say, a committee, a club, a court? And many different views have been developed. Um, here I'll just mention four uh, fairly simple views. So the first view I'll call the plurality view. This view says that a social group is just a plurality of individuals. So on this view, there is no object, distinct object, which is the social group. Rather, there's just a plurality of individuals. Second view, I'll call the aggregate view, says that a social group is an aggregate of individuals. So on this view, unlike on the plurality view, there is a further separate object, which is the social group, and it's identical to the aggregate of the individual members. Third view uh, is the set view. This view says that a social group is a set of individuals. Uh, and so like the aggregate view, it countenances this new object, which is the social group. Uh, but unlike the aggregate view, it identifies this object with a set rather than with an aggregate. And since a set is arguably an abstract object, on this view, unlike on the aggregate view, a set is this abstract, uh, sorry, a social group is this abstract entity. Okay, and finally, the fourth view uh, is the structured whole view. So on this view, a social group is a structured whole of individuals, or another way to put it, it's a realization of a structure where the individuals are realizing a certain structure. Um, and this is a view that Catherine Ritchie has developed in a series of papers. And so on this view, there's also this separate object, which is the social group, but that object is understood not just in terms of the individuals, but also in terms of this further thing, the structure. Okay, so these then are four different views about what a social group is. And so again, what I want to suggest is that these are not views about either anchoring or grounding. And so we can't adequately represent this debate as a debate either about anchoring or a debate about grounding. Okay, so let's start with anchoring. So I think, again, it's pretty clear that these are not views about what it is that puts in place or sets up certain principles concerning uh, social groups. So what about grounding? Uh, so I think the worry that was raised earlier uh, in the case of the money debate also applies here. But I think that there's a further reason here to think that this is not a debate about grounding. And that is that at least some of these views seem to agree on what grounds what, and in particular on what grounds the existence of a social group. So take, for example, uh, the aggregate view and the set view. So I think that on both of these views, plausibly, the existence of a social group is grounded in the existence of its members. And that's because in general, uh, grounding theorists think that the existence of a set is grounded in the existence of its members and uh, that the existence of an aggregate is grounded in the existence of its members. But that means that uh, these views would agree on what grounds the existence of a social group. Uh, nevertheless, as I tried to argue, uh, these are different views of groups. So on one of them, a group is this arguably abstract entity, a set, whereas on the other view, uh, it's not an abstract entity, but rather this aggregate of individuals. And so I think that shows that uh, this can't be a debate just about grounding. It has to be a debate about something else. Okay, so now I'll move on to uh, the last part of my talk uh, where I will briefly sketch an essentialist framework for social ontology. So the basic idea is that in addition to this building project in social ontology, we, which we can understand as 
uh, the grounding project and the anchoring project, or perhaps just a grounding project. There's also the essentialist project in social ontology. And the essentialist project asks, what is the essence of various social items? Where the social items in question might be social kinds or social objects, social properties, uh, or some other worldly item. Okay, so to spell out this project then, we need to uh, understand this notion of essence. So in the literature on essence, uh, there have been two main different ways of understanding this notion. So one is the modal conception of essence, and one is the real definition conception. So on the modal conception of essence, uh, an essential proper property of an individual is a property that that object uh, must have in any possible world in which it exists. So the object could not exist without having that property. So on the real definition conception, uh, which is a, a neo-Aristotelian conception that's been developed and defended by uh, various contemporary metaphysicians, including Kit Fine and E.J. Lowe and Catherine Kozlicki, we instead understand essence in terms of this notion of real definition. So a real definition is the worldly analog of a linguistic definition. So the idea is just as we can define a word by giving its meaning, so we can define, say, bachelor as unmarried man, so too we can give a definition of worldly items, of things like objects and properties, and that definition tells us what that thing is. Right, so an example of a real definition uh, would be that water is H2O, say. That's giving a real definition of water. It's telling us what water is. Another example would be uh, that Singleton Socrates is the set whose sole member is Socrates. That's telling us what Singleton Socrates is. So my suggestion then is that we can uh, understand this essentialist project in social ontology using this real definition conception of essence. So the essentialist project then is the project of giving real definitions of various social items that are of interest to us. And again, these can be uh, kinds, objects, properties, or other sorts of entities. Uh, so then returning to the two debates that I discussed earlier, um, the debate about the nature of money then, I suggest we can understand as a debate about the real definition of the kind money. And the different views I discussed, the functionalist view, uh, the, the causal powers view, the functional deontic view, and the deontic view, can be understood as different views about the real definition of money. Similarly, uh, the debate about the nature of social groups, I think, can be understood as a debate about the real definition of the kind social group. And the different views are giving competing answers uh, to this question of real definition. Okay, and so to conclude then, uh, I just want to note, I think there are many other uh, debates within social ontology that can also be understood as debates about uh, essence in this real definition sense. So I think some possible examples might include uh, debates about the nature of gender, about what it is to be a woman, um, and debates about race. Um, okay, so that, that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you for listening.